Welcome to Breaking Paradigms, a podcast where we talk about global perspectives on spatial planning in practice and theory, by Constance Frech and Sarah Kouchy. Article 25 of the Declaration of Human Rights states Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for their health and well-being of themselves and of their family, including food, clothing, housing and medical care and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond their control. In this episode, we'll dive into the topic of permanent temporality in built space. The right to housing, food, clothes, medical care and social services are clearly stated in Article 25 of the Human Rights Declaration. But structures that are specifically not built to last can put this resolution to the test. These temporary settlements can have different forms, whether it is refugee camps, informal settlements, hazard shelter or other areas that in their inception were not meant to last. Today we are specifically looking at refugee camps and how the tension between permanence and temporality influences the built environment. If you speak or rather read German, a great read on the topic is the master thesis by TU Vienna alumna Mariella Guz, Flüchtlingslager Ort der Permanente Vorläufigkeit, which is available for free to download and we'll link it on our website. Refugee camps in general are a highly politicized topic, and not just today. Since the inception of modern-day refugee camps, the big questions are who, where, how. However, we want to take a look through the scientific lens, and that means we'll start with some important definitions. The phenomenon of migration of people for various reasons hunger, conflicts, economic motivation, etc., is as old as humankind. Human beings always moved to improve their livelihoods. Big natural disasters, wars and long economic crises have brought big waves of refugees to other territories all around the world at all times. The increase of formalization of flight over the past decades brought up the phenomenon of refugee camps in the way we know them nowadays. Today, there are hundreds of refugee camps around the world. The largest formal refugee settlement by number of inhabitants of UNHCR houses about 860,000 people in Bangladesh, consisting mostly of the Rohingya minority. Numbers obviously change quite rapidly though. In 2015, The largest camp sheltered about 200,000 people and was actually established in 1992 in Kenya, as well as the second largest at the time, which housed about 100,000, also located in Kenya. Most settlements, however, are smaller, taking a look at some of the numbers they average at 10,000 to 50,000 people, usually on the higher end during establishment. If you consider the next town or city near you, 10 to 50,000 people might seem fairly small places. However, the establishment and functionality of these places is very different to those of a town. Refugee camps, first and foremost, serve a transitory purpose and are initially not meant for a permanent settlement. This, of course, doesn't mean that they don't. There are different types of refugee settlements and different ways of defining them. First off, 
a simple distinction, formal and informal camps. There are the officially recognized and registered camps. These are usually run by an organization or multiple organizations and register their inhabitants. These camps are located on land that is provided by the hosting nation and might be an open area but can also be a large building. Think of factory buildings or venue halls. Uh, informal camps, on the other hand, are usually established out of an immediate need for shelter. They are sometimes formalized later on, or the population is moved into formalized camps. However, this does not always happen. Haley, a researcher in the field of refugee camp typology, furthermore distinguishes between three categories of camps. Autonomy, control and necessity. Autonomy describes camps which are established through self-organization and people seek them out willingly. These camps offer a space for cultural practice and self-expression. The second category is control. These camps have a strategic use and are erected by governments and are meant to confine populations to a specific space. They are holding areas or waiting areas, often established at or near borders in the refugee context. At the EU border, they are currently a common practice. The third category is necessity. These are usually spatial expressions to crises or catastrophes, and Haley puts them between autonomy and control. They have a strategy of providing during a crisis, but might lack the support, freedoms and or protections of either of the other categories. Certain categories are obviously more likely to be formal than informal, but oftentimes they go hand in hand. Many reports show clearly that formal camps are often near to informal ones. And due to rapid processes, clear legal boundaries are not always transparent. And numbers can, as with all statistics, be taken with a grain of salt. Depending on the reason for displacement, camps can be disbanded within a few years or stay put for a long time. Which puts us to one of the biggest challenges of refugee camps, housing, more specifically housing standards. Most countries provide a very clear minimum standard of houses or structures, especially permanent ones, and with good reason. Depending on local climate, provisions like insulation, heating or cooling systems, structural integrity of a building, etc. are important. Many of these standards are contrived from a long history of trial and error. However, enforcing them in a crisis situation is somewhere between tricky to impossible. Still, the Article 25 of the Human Rights Declaration clearly states that there is a right to a standard of living adequate for health and well-being of a person. So let's look at the standards that are set. Specifically, we'll look at the standards set by the UNHCR and we'll link the website in the description of our episode as always. Unfortunately, we could not clearly establish if these were binding and legally enforceable. However, we assume, as mentioned in our previous episode, that the standards set by the UN agency are recommendations, but national laws apply. Therefore, camps organized by the UNHCR should fulfill these standards, but camps by other organizations are not legally obligated. In the interview part later on, we'll hear some accounts in regards to the standards on site as well. But let's start at the first step, finding a plot. The UNHCR doesn't buy land. Therefore, in accordance with the hosting country, a piece of public land is offered or private land is acquired by the hosting nation. Most importantly, the space needs to have infrastructural access. Most importantly, road access and access to potable water during all seasons. 
the location can't be exposed to natural hazards or contamination and even in emergency cases should be the option to be used as a longer term presence. Ideally, the land is facilitating the cultural and social needs of the displaced people. For example, if they are farmers, they should be on farmland. However, the UNHCR states that often the other requirements are difficult to meet and this often can't be fulfilled. Regardless of the type of emergency shelter used, the following principles generally apply. Shelters must provide protection from the elements, space to live and store belongings, privacy and emotional security. Blankets, mats and tarpaulin must be provided as needed. Refugee shelters should be culturally and socially appropriate and familiar where possible. Suitable local materials are best if available. Shelter must be adequate regardless of seasonal weather patterns. If not, it should be adapted accordingly. Wherever possible, persons of concern should be empowered to build their own shelter with the necessary organizational and material support. This will help to ensure that shelter will meet their particular needs, promote a sense of ownership and self-reliance and reduces costs and construction time considerably. If we continue structurally, the next level are the typology of settlement. These only include open settlements and not those inside larger buildings. Even though they are not a standard as such, there are four common cluster typologies according to the shelter center. Standard plan, hollow square plan, Staggered square plan, community road plan. As this is a very visual topic, we recommend checking out the thesis of Mariella Goose on page 97, where you can find a clear overview. But break it down in the simplest terms, each cluster consists of 16 family plots. They are aligned in different ways depending on the cluster typology and might have a more communal or less communal feel depending on the local situation. The family plots include shelter and a latrine for each plot. The cluster shares a communal shower, water tap and garbage disposal. The minimum size of a living space per person should be 3.5 square meters and 4.5 square meters in colder climates with a general minimum ceiling height of 2 meters at highest point. 30 to 45 square meters are allocated for the communal space per person. However, in longer term settlements, the acceptable minimum is considered at 35 square meters. The communal space includes places like a kitchen, but also kitchen gardens or space for children on the family plot as well, as cluster space, such as the showers, water tap, etc. And it also includes space for the camp for administration, roads, etc. Schools and distribution centers are provided for every 5,000 inhabitants. Healthcare centers, markets and feeding centers per every 20,000 inhabitants. On a smaller scale, there needs to be at least one latrine for 20 people, a shower for 50 people and a water tap for every 80 people. Shelter can have different forms and the UNHCR states that design of shelter should, if possible, provide for modification by its occupants to suit their individual needs. Shelter should be adapted according to the geographical context, the climate, the cultural practice and habits, the local availability of skills, as well as accessibility to adequate construction materials in a given country. Due considerations should be given to the operational phase. What may be deemed adequate during an emergency in terms of shelter, for example plastic sheeting, tents, and average camp area per person cannot be regarded 
as adequate in a protracted displacement situation, meaning a longer-term displacement. There's a difference between a temporary space and a permanent space. The UNHCR acknowledges this even within their standards for planning refugee settlements. They specifically state that the immediate and long-term aid have different frameworks. Generally, when looking at the minimum standards, the functionality of the space definitely has the highest priority. Therefore, it's not surprising that researchers like Manuel Herz are asking not to see the camps just as functional places, but rather to see them as temporary cities, giving this transitory space a different type of identity. We will link his publications on our website. To gain some insights on the social aspects and realities, we interviewed two volunteers of the organization SOS Balkanroute, Yasmin and Katharina, who have experience with the current situation in Bosnia. What is your background and how are you connected with the topic of refugee camps? So yeah, I'm Yasmin and the first time I went to Bosnia to help refugees was in 2018. And it was basically just my friend calling me because there were two people taking care of over 800 people. And they called us up so they were like, hey, we need some people here to help. Like people are hungry, we don't have enough clothes, nothing. Yeah, so I just jumped in the car, collected a lot of clothes and went down there with a friend of mine. And then I was in the middle of hell, um, just eight hours drive. And suddenly you're kind of, it's like, it's like war basically because people don't have anything. And till then, um, if you see it once, you can't stop helping because it's like you have to help those people. It's not okay what is happening there. And um, then when I went back to Vienna, I joined SOS Balkanroute. Um, because they're doing really great things here as well with awareness and bringing down donations. Yeah, and um, I'm kind of was friends with the founder of um, SS Balkanroute, Peter Rosandic. You might know him as Kid Packs. And um, he took me down there uh, last year in November, um, I think October, November. And um, I'm uh, making a documentary about the refugee situation there which is um, changing every week, which is getting harder every week. And yeah, I studied um, film, so um, my focus uh, lies on um, showing a different perspective, um, different media, kind of um, how, how we perceive refugees, how we perceive this crisis. And my name is Katarina Simonic. What types of social, economic or other functional infrastructure or services are provided and which ones are created in refugee camps by the inhabitants themselves. So I can talk a lot about the city called Velika Kladusha. Um, it's directly behind the border to Croatia. And um, as I said, first time I went there was 2018. And back in 2018, it was just like more and more people would arrive in Bosnia. So most Bosnians, they didn't know what's going on. And as it's a country which isn't that long ago... Um, out of the war and people started helping so they went in the parks gave the people food clothes and then like everyone was kind of in the city and in the parks so the government decided they will make um, a place outside of the city it's a really small city so um, the place they decided was a really dry um, field like there was no grass on it it was super dry and um, they just decided like the people should go there and um, but there were no tents there was not even a water connection nothing so they just started dumping these people on this really dry place so we had children babies in there everything and um, like the friend of mine and um, they were called SOS Kladusha so um, they started making like a water line because next to it there was um, a place for dogs like a dog shelter so they could get some water there that at least people would have running water there were maybe three Dixie toilets that's it and what we did the whole summer there, because um, it was the fight between UNHCR and IOM, who's going to take this camp. But till the decision is done, who's going to take care of these people, nothing is happening. So the people were just getting dumped on this place without tents or anything. And just was the locals helping them or um, volunteers from up road helping. So um, what we were doing is basically um, we started building tents out of wood and plastic foil 
So you would make a construct out of wood and put plastic foil around it that people don't have to sleep in the rain or at least have, it was 36, 37 degrees in summer, that they at least have some shadow. Um, Red Cross gave out food every day, but maybe for 80% or 70%. So it was never enough food for everyone. So um, this was the situation back then in 2018. They weren't showers or anything, like another organization called No Name Kitchen. They started doing a shower place where um, like one day is man shower day and then women and children could shower. So you had to be in the line. They maybe had four or five showers so um, that people can at least wash themselves. And then there is wild, wild camps who just built up because um, in those official camps, there are many problems mm. also. Um, And there is not enough food and there is a strict kind of rule. The police is very brutal with the refugees. So the wild camps kind of appear next to it or somewhere. Um, you don't have any private privacy in these big camps because um, like there are no walls in between. It's just like a huge hall and they put everyone inside. So at the beginning, they didn't even care about putting the children out, for example. So it was like a lot of people in one big hall. So you can't sleep at night because... People are loud at night, um, like some people drink alcohol, so it's really hard for others to get some rest at least. And um, as well, if you put that many people in a hall together without privacy and they're all really desperate, for sure fights are going to start. And as well, if you just give food to 70%, um, if people are hungry, they know like if you make always when they give out food, it's like make a line, make a line. So everyone has to line up. And if you know that you're in the back of the line, you won't get any food. And um, everyone tries to get in the front of the line. So um, this is why there are so much fights in these camps as well, because no privacy, not enough food. At the beginning as well, the showers weren't warm. <laughs> the first 10 people which could shower in winter time had warm showers. After this, it was cold. Um, they don't have, they don't get soaps in there for washing their hands. This is as well like a really high risk you now in this Corona time that people can't wash themselves. And considering the food and the starvation problem, this makes people just um, even more aggressive and it doesn't make anything better. Yeah, from the infrastructure in Wild Camp, I can also tell something really nice. So um, back in 2018, like people would arrive in the middle of the night because they get pushed back. So they come back from the border, Croatian police beat them up and they're having wounds, blue spots, didn't eat or drink for over 10 or 11 days. And um, yeah, so it's they're doing their own infrastructure. Like they don't want other people to help them. It's in their culture, it's really hard to accept help. So they also want to do something. And we started building tents, as I said. So they ask us, hey, can you leave your gear overnight? We will give it back tomorrow. So we just left like the saw and everything there. So they started going in the woods and building themselves like <laughs> way more amazing tents that we could build. And um, by their own, they started making like a hotel tent. So the hotel tent was a really big tent in the middle and um, as well was a cooking space. So um, Ali, this was one of the guys which was like, okay, I'm going to take care of the hotel. So if a group of 15 people or 30 people could fit under this tent, it was like kind of a shadow tent. So if people would arrive in the night, everyone would send them to the hotel tent and then Ali would get up in the middle of the night with his friends and start cooking for them. So we left them some flour um, and just with flour and water, they dig a hole in the ground, make a fire and um, start making like, what's it, what is it called again? The The bread, pitata, um, chapati, chapati. <laughs> chapati, and what's the other one? Butter naan, you just naan. And um, yeah, so like from the infrastructure, it's it always it's changing. Like the whole situation is changing. For example, we had this one factory, and like most of the people which don't have space in the IOM camps. Um, they go into empty buildings because it's an old war country. So um, what they're having is like a lot of empty buildings. Most places have a local identity which inhabitants identify with. Refugee camps are usually considered as transit spaces. But is there a sense of place and how would you describe it? Do inhabitants identify with the space? And if so, how? So, um, like, as I said, I went to Vilika Kladusha the first time in 2018. And now, like, I came back 2020 or in between as well. And they're still the same people. 
So it's maybe a transit place because they keep on trying the game. But a lot of people I met back then, they already gave up on it. Like they just decide, okay, we are in Kladusha now and they don't have energy to try anymore. So for sure they adapt to the place. Like people know them. They would never identify with this place as, as their home. Like their home is always to stay Afghanistan or Syria. Like this is their home and they just had to escape because of war. But um, yeah, they're completely like, they know the city by heart. They know every single place because they're stuck there for such a long time. Refugee camps face different challenges depending on their location and circumstances. One of the largest ones from a planning perspective is the issue of temporary versus permanent settlement. What are the most immediate needs? And do the immediate needs interfere with the needs that are more long-term? especially in a spatial context? And how should we consider a refugee camp? A transitory space or a temporary city? What is the difference? And how do we plan temporary human settlements? At the end of this episode, we seem to only have more questions than answers. So we thought to ask you some. As the interactive part, we'll quiz you a bit. Go to breakingparadigms.org slash refugee camps and take the quiz. Check how much you remember of this episode. This was Breaking Paradigms by Constanze Frey and Sarah Couchier. Be part of the conversation. If you like what we do, consider supporting us and join our Patreon community. Connect with us on Facebook, YouTube and at breakingparadigms.org. Content and editing by Constance Fe and Sarah Couchet. Sound design by Didac Barroso and Florian Frey.